and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Eric and she reminds me of an afternoon I spent once in Paris, to the west of Paris, in Saint Germain en Laye. I don't know if anyone's been there. Saint Germain en Laye uh, was the chateau of the um, French kings before they moved to Versailles. It's also the place where they installed the Jacobites uh, until they, they had to leave after the Treaty of Utrecht. However, the reason I was there was to go further and to, to visit the grave of Marguerite uh, Power, Countess of Blessington. But I discovered this when I got there. I didn't have time, the bus would have taken too long to get there, so I had to retreat without ever seeing her grave. Anyway, Lady Blessington was uh, an interesting person, as we'll see this evening, because uh, she was uh, connected with many people who were Byron. Um, she had a very close friend in Camp Dorsey, and um, also she was uh, um, a patron of just on this evening of our Madden, uh, uh, who was one of the people, antiquarians, that I was going to speak of this evening, along with uh, Francis Joseph Bigger. So I won't play too much on that, except to say what a delight it is to have Guy with us. Um, he is, he's, for many years, he's had a wonderful reputation for scholarship and, and generous scholarship and that, but uh, I think it's wonderful that his year with us has been a, an, seen an extraordinary blossoming even further in his reputation. Uh, he's a professor of history at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Israel and, and he uh, has for, for some years been known for his book on 1798, Remembering the Year of the French, Irish Folk History and Social Memory, a very acclaimed book that won a number of, of prizes, and as the title suggests, he's a historian of memory. Um, but recently then he's published a, another book, um, Forgetful Remembrance, Social Forgetting and Vernacular Historiography of Rebellion in Ulster, also of the 1790s. And it has really um, made, made a major impact, not only in our studies, but internationally, as is witnessed by the fact of the Kayahing too go away on several occasions to pick up international awards in several different countries, including the George L. Moss Prize, um, awarded annually by the American Historical Association, the Catherine Biggs, Briggs Award, um, awarded by the Folklore Society of London, and, and the Irish Historical Research Prize, among other prizes. So it's, it's been wonderful to have him here at this uh, moment when his standing which was already high has um, increased even, even more. We look forward very much to his, his talk on Madden and, and Bigger. You may not have heard of them, but of course, if you were a denizen of Bootestown, County Dublin, you'd know Madden because there's a blue plaque outside the house in Virginia on Bootestown Avenue. And in the local church, there's, a, there's, a, there's also another plaque to him. So he, uh, those of us who have never heard frequented Bootestown would know Madden, and I know him, of course, because I've used his work on Lady Blessington and my own writing. So, without further ado, let me call on um, Guy to speak to us, after which we have a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for showing up on a rainy night. Um, it's just great numbers, it's fantastic. I've been told that I should speak from the podium. Usually I wander around the space, but since it's being recorded, so I have to stand in front of the microphone and I'll do as such, as I've been instructed. It's, it's a great privilege to be here, not only in these remarkable surroundings. Uh, the day I arrived, the day after I arrived, Christian brought me in here and took me on a tour and said, you'll be speaking in this room, and so well, this is, I've been waiting for this for, for since I arrived. And really, being in Boston College, which is an incomparable place to be at the Burns Library, working with the collections of the Burns Library, and also having the privilege of teaching students. And I see quite a few both undergraduate and most and graduate students here, which is a great privilege to see people here and colleagues. And this really is one of the leading centers of Irish studies, definitely in North America and in the world. So it's a moment of reverence for me, so thank you very much for according this honor to me. I'll be trying out some new research here, or something different from what I've done. Um, it touches on things which tangentially touch on the book. I'll comment on that. So it somehow relates to the book, which I've been giving lots of talks recently all the time about the book. But I thought that what I'd like to do here is do something different. And so, hence the title, and I'll introduce you to two people. I'll explain the topic briefly. So perhaps the key 
issue here is the theme, relocating nationalism between the regional and the transnational. These are big topics, which could be approached if I was coming from political science, for example. These would be key topics. I mean, what do we do with this term nationalism? For years, we've been accustomed to looking at the world through the prism of the nation as a major category. But that's been challenged. It's always been challenged by regionalism. People who didn't see themselves within the nation state, who believed they had an, an autonomous or a desire for independence, an independence searching or a separatist view, but couldn't fit within the larger framework of the nation. But even more so, scholarship has begun looking at frameworks of transnationalism, where nations meet each other, where people move in and out about movement. So where do we locate the nation within this context? And quite often, if we look at the debates, the debates would see tension between these terms. Nationalism is always seen in context with regionalism, the region which is contesting the notion of saying that the nation is, in the French phrase, one and indivisible. But it's not so, it's multifaceted, uh, porous maybe in other ways. In the same way, transnationalism has challenged our notion of whether the nation is a self-contained unit or whether it should be much more porous. And of course, Ireland is a great place to look at these debates. Ireland now would be even more so, it might seem so. If we look at Ireland, just thinking how we locate the, the, the dial itself. Those who took my course would know that I often start with a slide like this, because it's about thinking where Ireland fits within its relationship with the United Kingdom, the British Isles, Europe, the Atlantic Ocean, the world. Where do we locate Ireland in these cases? How much of it is nationalism and how much is it affected by transnationalism? And then, of course, Ireland itself constantly engaging with issues of localism and regionalism and has to, by definition, because of Northern Ireland, or traditionally because of Ulster. There's many other reasons why it should engage with regionalism, but it's always been a political issue. So I'm flagging this because it's a major concern, and one might even say now, in the current politics, it's even a more pertinent concern. But what I would like to try to do today is looking at this topic from a different angle, quite an unexpected angle, perhaps the last place we think of looking to shed light on this issue. And I'm turning to, for that reason, to lives and works of amateur historians. And the stress here is on the amateur, on purpose. We have a problem with amateur historians in the academy. We don't quite know what to do with them. We have this notion that history in the academy is about professional history. It's being professionalized. That's what historiography is all about. And anything which is amateur seems to read with antiquarianism. That's how things used to be done in the past. It's not true for every discipline. I know, I know that there are at least two people here from Harvard and Celtic studies. There's a different approach towards antiquarian, which I think is much more appreciative. But I can say within Irish history, and this is something I'm writing in context with this, in a different case, I was asked to review Irish historiography. For many people, Irish historiography, modern Irish historiography, begins with the professionalization of the discipline in the 1930s. Anything before that is amateurish is of little value, supposedly. And this comes with a lot of baggage. The notion of antiquarianism comes with baggage. Just think of images, just to kind of to catch our eye. I like particularly this image of Chardin, um, the monkey antiquarian. An antiquarian is something to be ridiculed, this obsession with looking at old paper and old texts and looking at material artifacts and what do you do with it. It's fascinating, at the same time ridiculous. Or of course, Sir Walter Scott's famous novel, The Antiquary, in which the antiquarian is ridiculed. And at the same time, ridiculed with a certain amount of sympathy, because of course Walter Scott was himself an antiquarian. He had an appreciation for what he was engaging with, but at the same time realized that these people seemed to be a relic of the past as they were studying relics of the past. Now, in all my work, I've always found antiquarianism a remarkable place to begin looking at, a place which really requires uh, our full attention and appreciation. And so what I'd like to do today is introduce you to two, many of you might already know them, I'm not pretending to introduce you for the first time, but to talk about two people who wouldn't be the first names mentioned when we choose the important figures to deal with these larger political issues of Irish history, and history at large. And the two figures are Richard Robert Madden, 
and Francis Joseph Bucher. It's a challenge for me, mainly because the way I was schooled in history, um, I have to learn and to come to terms with writing biographical work. For me, I've always treated biographical work as an auxiliary discipline. I turn to works of biography to take out the details I need to put them in a larger social context. Of course, there are fabulous traditions of writing biographies. The one I'm looking at here is not quite writing a biography. If it doesn't even approach or crouch on that term, it would be to write two biographies in tandem. The notion of comparative biography is, is intriguing in its own right. It's not that these things haven't been done, but quite often they'd be done on a synchronic level. People of the same time, let's compare Hitler and Stalin and see how they work in tandem. This is a diachronic approach. I'm looking at two people who have a moment of overlap, but largely Madden is a man of the first half of the 19th century. That's when he flourished. And Bigger is a man of the second half of the 19th century, in the turn of the century. So there's something almost historical what I'm doing here. I'm looking at two people from slightly different times who meet at a certain point. <laughs> and I think there's lessons to be learned comparing. Now, I'll only get to the comparing at the very end because it'll take me a while just to talk about these two remarkable individuals, and that's worth the talk in itself, I think. <laughs> just dwelling on these two incredible individuals, which is quite a tour through the 19th century. So let's start one by one, if we may. I would have liked to do the two in tandem. I didn't quite figure out how to do it. At first, I thought I'd put two screens here and see the two at the same time, but it didn't work for me. Um, let's start with Madden. Let's start with the first one. Richard Robert Madden. This is probably how he would like to have been remembered as a portrait from the National Gallery. Uh, as a writer, we'll see, he was very prolific, remarkably prolific in a century which everybody seemed to be prolific in the 19th century. And this is how he is as a younger man. He was the youngest child of a Catholic family. Uh, his father, Edward Madden, was a silk merchant, a very prosperous silk merchant in, uh, in, in Dublin. And he was the 21st child. Oh. Well, had two marriages, he was the 11th, the second marriage. Um, and he wanted to go into medicine. He trained as an apothecary. And he went over through the mother's connections to France, to Bordeaux, and then to Paris, and then ended up in Italy, in Naples, and then in Italy, trained as an apothecary, moved on to surgery and medicine, but developed a passion for travel, which is quite interesting here. So you can see this picture, which was drawn by Count d'Orsay. Alfred Count d'Orsay is an interesting story as well, but I won't dwell on him, in Naples in 1828. So this is the young madam, and in his travels in Naples and in Italy, First of all, he began writing journals, which is interesting. We might touch on that a little later. The Morning Chronicle was a venue which he was, throughout his life, he wrote articles for the Morning Chronicle. But the interesting point here is that he met some remarkable individuals. And most importantly, he met a figure who James knows quite well, so I have to tread on this, tread on this carefully here. Um, the most gorgeous, she was often called in her time, Marguerite Gardner, the Countess of Blessington. Now you can see that picture there, which was quite scandalous in its day when it was displayed at the Royal Academy. Um, she was quite a scandalous person in herself, in her marriages, in her affairs or non-affairs, in her associations with people, including with Count d'Orsay, but in particular for the fact that she was an independent woman who traveled to different places, met all the greats of the Romantic era, and conducted a remarkable, hosted a remarkable literary salon in London. You always think of the salons of Paris, but had this remarkable literary salon and cultivated young writers together with all the greats, mainly associated with Whig politics. Anybody who was anybody wanted to be there, and more or less she became the patron of Madden. And Madden was also commissioned, accordingly, to write a biography, which is a huge thing. He got all these papers throughout his life, as he writes here in volume one, these things are all big events, it's a three volume biography. As he writes there, um, he had this uninterrupted friendship with the late Countess of Blessington during a period of 27 years and the advantage of possessing the entire confidence of that lady. And that's why he's qualified to write the biography. He's critical of her writing now, she was a novelist, and he's critical of her writing in points, but he's also careful to show her great respect. And that says something about a man which we'll see later, and he's been criticized about this, that when he wrote about topics, he always treated with a certain reverence. And that's an interesting point. So we're starting with this point of him within the circle of the Countess of Blessington, but also meeting him in the Mediterranean. That's where they met him in the Mediterranean. And he continues on to travel. 
So his first part of his life, he engages in travel. He travels in what would today be the Middle East of today, or the, the Near East. He travels in, from Italy he goes on, uh, he's in Greece during the War of Independence, as part of the Ottoman Empire, of course. He's a pan-Hellenic, like many of the others, a philo-Hellenist. From there he travels through Turkey, he travels through Syria, Palestine, down to Egypt, down into Africa. Um, has remarkable adventures. I'm just reading this little video when he writes two volumes about it. I think it's quite remarkable. Um, it has been my fate to be taken for a spy in Syria, to have endangered my life in Candia for refusing to administer poison, to have been shot in Candia twice, and once on the Nile by Turkish soldiers, to have been accused of changing the fragments of a broken statue into gold and thieves. That's all these adventures. Um, to have been taken captive by Greek pirates for wearing a long beard when taken in a vessel bearing Turkish property. So he has this life of adventure. You can see him in his orientalist garb as he's dressed, as he explains in places. This is, he has to wear this disguise in places, otherwise, he's already been kidnapped by pirates. Uh, so he has all these adventures, and he ends up writing this travel book, which is quite well received. People read it with great interest. It's this orientalist interest. In fact, he left marks wherever he went, as many travelers did at the time. This is thanks to a modern day antiquarian who's obsessed with looking at graffiti of travelers. So you can actually follow Madden all around his travels in Egypt. As you go up to the upper Nile from the area of Luxor to the Dam of Aswan, you can see the name Madden scribbled, inscribed on all these various temples. This was quite common at the time. So Madden in 1820 and 26 is traveling to all these remarkable temples and inscribing his name alongside many other greats, going back at least as far back as the Napoleonic soldiers slightly before that, and even further than that. And, not only does he write a two-volume uh, <coughs> book about his travels, he also writes a novel, The Musulman, the Muslim. Exoticized, romanticized, and yet seen by many, both of them are read together, when they're reviewed, very well reviewed by various journals, as sources of information. This is somebody who's been to these areas. And many people is introducing the Near East to European audiences, which is quite remarkable. His travels, he meets remarkable people on the way, while traveling in Italy. And going over towards Palestine, he meets Moses Montefiore, to become later Sir Moses Montefiore, the great um, Jew patron of Jewish emancipation in England. Um, and with Moses Montefiore, they strike a relationship which continues for years later. In the 1840s, in fact, um, he's invited by Montefiore to join him on an expedition, which he's actually commissioned by the Whig government to represent the government on this expedition, this expedition to investigate uh, pogroms, which are happening in Damascus. There was a blood libel in Damascus in 1840, and he's sent to investigate it. So Madden is part of this investigation. This also tells you a little about the kind of causes that he supports, that he espouses. We'll see how this develops. They end up meeting Mehmet or Muhammad Ali in Egypt. They go to Egypt to meet the great uh, leader of the area who's battling against the Ottoman Empire, against the Turks at the time, and they're invited to the court. It's quite remarkable because Montefiore is kind of, uh, Muhammad Ali has little interest in the question of the Jews, but he's actually interested to hear uh, Madden's questions about slaves. Madden is very sensitive about the slaves that he sees in the Near East, and he ends up writing a book specifically about <coughs> Egypt and Muhammad Ali, illustrating the condition of his slaves and subjects. This is a major topic, as we'll see, is coming out here. And another book that comes out of that is his thoughts. And these are all coming out in multiple volumes and numerous editions, at least two editions for each one of these books. So these are quite well read. The Turkish Empire and its relations with Christianity and civilization. It's another of his books. I'm flagging the question of slavery because that's a cause which Madden espouses. He's not the only person at the time. Uh, it's something which bothers him, the question of slavery, just as slavery is an issue within the British Empire at the time. And so his next book will be in 1833, thanks to the connection with Lexington's and his connections with the Whig government. He's always seen, he's always, whenever the Whig government is in power, that's when he gets his appointments. He's sent over to the West Indies, to Jamaica of today, uh, as a special magistrate which is quite remarkable, and he's there specifically to help foresee the release of slaves, the emancipation of slaves in the West Indies. Remarkably difficult uh, chore. He has connections to West Indies, 
uh, his wife Harriet, who uh, accompanies him throughout his life. Uh, his wife, uh, the father had property in Jamaica. Madden, through his mother, uh, turns out that they are people that have owned property in Jamaica as well, including he found out that he has cousins who are mulattoes there, some of them have been enslaved, and he's bothered about these issues. And he's there to take on this whole issue of emancipating slaves, and he gets into terrible trouble with the slave owners, some of them Irish. He gets into serious issues. Within 12 months, he has to resign because he's demanding the release of slaves. And this becomes an issue which he's not willing to give up, which he returns to again and again. The next episode, this will happen, was in his next posting. His next posting is to Cuba. He sent the island of Cuba to Havana again as the role of superintendent in regards to the release of slaves. Uh, Cuba is a Spanish colony, as we know, but it's under British administration effectively in these years. So he's sent over, and he's also a judge of this mixed court. That's his role. Um, and while he's there, he writes, or well, he'll write later a report on the island of Cuba. So he's all the time thinking and investigating and looking at what he sees, numbering how the plantations are going, how they depend on slaves, what other economic options are there. But also there's something else which is remarkable. He befriends a released slave, a man by the name of Manzano. And he helps Manzano write his autobiography. He translates it from Spanish. And his poetry, Manzano has poems. And so he publishes this incredible text, just poems of a slave, published in English, with the life of the slave, the former slave. And this is something that Madden sees as a cause which is important for him to publish. This is giving a bit more uh, about his life. More than that, when he's in Cuba, Cuba, as we know, has always been a sphere which America had interest in, already back then. Um, when he's in Cuba, he published a book here in Boston, the book is published in Boston, where he takes to task the involvement of Americans in the slave trade in Cuba, um, and how this is done through very shady circumstances. And this lands him in a remarkable situation. He gets an invitation to be a witness at the Amistad trial. For those who know the story of the famous Amistad and both the slave rebellion, which lands in America, and then there's a trial, should they return the slaves, should they return the slaves? I'm wondering about the undergraduates, how many are familiar with it, because it would have been known well in the past when Steven Spielberg did his movie, but that was a while back. So he's a witness at the Amistad trial. He's got all these kind of historical moments, traveling the world, getting to all these places. Um, more than that, he's an authority on the situation of slavery in Cuba. So much so that he writes about it and addresses slavery in Cuba, which he presents at the famous 1840 conference the first convention on slavery in, in, in London, the Anti-Slavery Society Convention. So I reckon you can spot Madden in the crowd there. Actually you can. You can because there's a key in the National Portrait Gallery, and so with the key we can spot him out. Madden is over there. So that's Madden sitting in the crowd, presenting his address to this great moment of uh, this anti-slavery convention. The picture is interesting for other reasons in this forum I might just mention because you might know who this gentleman is over here. Any takers? Of course, of course, James. That's Daniel O'Connor, who of course would have been there. And Madden, in many ways, is an O'Connor. Right? He's inspired by this uh, moment of Catholic liberalism, which has great interest, just like O'Connor's interest, which are international. He's, in many ways, the key figure of Irish nationalism in the first half of the 19th century, but he's also an international. So the story of Madden, the story of Daniel O'Connor is well known. The story of Madden, perhaps he lives, so that's why I'm taking a slightly different path. Um, our next post will be then to Africa, which is remarkable. He'll be sent to the west coast of Africa, the area of Gambia today, again dealing with areas which supposedly the slaves were released, but what he really exposes are is what's called the pawn system, the P-A-W-N, pawn system, in which the slaves are effectively enslaved again by various interest parties. And when he exposes this, he runs against big interests. These are people who are well connected with the government, these are very powerful merchants, some of them are MPs, and they denounce this whole thing as slander. So man is blamed for kind of spilling the beans on this issue. He's the whistleblower in today's terms, and whistleblowers, of course, have to be investigated. So uh, that's how he lands his career. He's more or less run out of his position there again. But again, time and time again, going where he believes he has to be. This leads him in a kind of a slump. He doesn't have employment for a while, but he remembers 
one thing he knows how to do is to write. He goes to Portugal of all places, and then he writes a history of Portugal, unpublished. He writes stories for the morning for the for the, for the morning chronicle the whole time. I say unpublished because you're going to see a lot of published works here, and this is just a portion of what he wrote. One of the things of tracing the Madden Trail is to realize how much he wrote which wasn't published and how much has been lost. So he's published, he wrote more than what he published, and he's already published more than most of us, maybe the whole room together can do it in our, in our lifetime, which, which, is, which is remarkable. His role after that uh, is Colonial Secretary in Western Australia. And this is interesting. He goes to Western Australia and immediately sparks a relationship with his interest in Aboriginals and the concerns of Aboriginals, always looking for the downtrodden oppressed. And also various Irish settlers who are in dire circumstances. But at the same time, he ran into trouble with people of power, many of them Irish as well. So in also in Australia, he runs into trouble uh, and is in conflict with people, but he also suffers a personal tragedy. His son drowns working on, as an engineer on the Shannon. Um, and so he returns to Ireland and decides to stop his travels. And he returns to Ireland, um, I should say, in between all of this. He goes in 1847 to Western Australia. But before he does that, he stops in Ireland in 1847. And he comments on the famine. He writes a poem about the famine. A farewell in Ireland in the famine year. Now Madden is a poet. Not the most well-known poet, maybe in terms of literary skill, but the best poet. But he publishes all the time, which is remarkable in its own self. as this kind of a source, a literary source, which has been little written about. And I thought that interesting that he writes a famine poem. And then when he returns to Ireland um, in 1850, his connections in the government uh, get him a post of the Secretary of the Lower Fund. He sits in Dublin, but he's engaged still with famine relief, and he compiles a report on the role of the poor law system in the famine years. The poor law system has a lot to be accountable for in the famine years, and he writes about that. So that's an interesting source, which hasn't been really worked with that much in uh, famine studies. So all of this work is coming in. He sees himself always as a writer, not just as an administrator, as an emancipator of slaves, as a journalist, as a doctor. He's a practicing doctor throughout most of these years until he stops with his travels. But he had a clinic for a long time uh, in London. I'll comment briefly on some of his books, just briefly. I mean, this is a topic in itself. Two books here on issues which might relate, I'd say, to the Catholic Church. He writes a biography of Savonarola famous Franciscan, uh, I could see already Christian, they're, they're just, yeah, they're the Franciscan, let's, let's say overzealous, can we put it, in, in Renaissance uh, Florence. And maybe that's exactly Madden's interest. He, he's a very tolerant person, so he's, a, he's interested in people who are fanatics. And he looks at sources which are interesting there. He also writes a book later on Galileo and Inquisition. And that's an interesting book which was praised in its day because of his use of the Vatican archives. In a time when the Vatican archives were actually had been plundered twice by French, sol by French soldiers. In 1848 and 1860s, it was in danger. So he's going there, he's documenting material, very pedantic. And these are sources quite often are access to many of these materials which are lost through Madden. So that's interesting in itself. Other books that he wrote about, The Infirmities of Genius, Literary Genius, his interesting kind of passion and the way people work. It's quite interesting how he sees it. And again, fanatics, phantasma or illusions of fanaticisms. So he's trying as a man who sees himself as rational to see what guides people into fanaticism. And that's also interesting. Um, a bit more. Shrines and Sepulchres. And these are all kind of two volumes, all these books. It's remarkable that they're, they're, they're not of writing. Shrines and sepulchres of the old world and the new. He's, he's always an antiquarian. Everywhere when he looks at places, he wants to see the monuments, he wants to see the temples, he wants to investigate their history. So he's looking at these shrines and temples um, on both sides of the plant, which is remarkable. And then primeval antiquity, monuments of primeval antiquity, and interesting for its comparative approach. So he's looking at Ireland and England and France, but also Northern Africa, which was the kind of notion which would have worked with antiquarians, especially in the first half of the 19th century. So it seems quite accept uh, acceptable. And then he's also obsessed with forgeries. What happens if the documents that he's seen are forgeries? How do you detect them? Again, this aspect which always troubled antiquarians, how gullible, always, always been accused of being gullible. So he writes about ancient literary frauds and forgeries in Spain and Italy. He spent time in Spain and Italy. And then afterwards in Ireland, looking at prophecies of Colin Kill. All these prophecies circulating, how far do they really go back? 
asking questions. Maybe his conclusions are not always sound, but he asks the right questions in any case and deals with a lot of interesting material, which I find interesting. And all of this, we've seen Madden as an internationalist, traveling around the world, engaging in great political causes, raising big questions. But he's always interested in Irish history. He's not just an antiquarian, he's an Irish antiquarian. So before we get maybe to his most famous work, some of the other works, he writes a history of the connection of England and Ireland, the two crowns, the history of that. As a Catholic, he writes a history of the penal laws, a topic which of course is pertinent to him. Um, and a history, a two-volume history of periodicals. So if you want to know a newspaper history, a topic which is quite current today, you have to start with Madden's history of periodicals, two volumes. And that's before getting to his work, which he's most well known for. If people would have heard of Madden, I would wager most people would have heard of him because of his monumental history of the United Irishmen. The United Irishmen, their lives and times. I'll only comment on this briefly because I've written about it elsewhere. It's a topic which is well known. I just say it's difficult to decipher exactly the scope of the project, or to understand the scope of the project, because it comes out all the time in new editions, a new series. Some people thought it's just the same book being repeated again and again. But thanks to people like Christopher Woods of the Royal Irish Academy, a very pedantic scholar who's looked at it, we can decipher and see exactly how it came out. 1842, first series, two volumes. 1843, second series, two volumes. 1846, third series, three volumes. Then there's a second edition, which is actually a new series, of four volumes. Eleven volumes, to which there's other volumes which weren't published. Now this actually is a topic which he hits on by chance. In between postings, in between Jamaica and Cuba, and before going to Australia, he arrives in America. And in America he meets some of the last United Irishmen before they pass away. He meets McNevin, um, James, James McNevin up in New York, and they, he realizes it's a living history. He's speaking with somebody who witnessed, who was one of the senior, the last surviving senior leader of the United Irishmen. But there he can also meet the wives, the relatives. He can meet Matilda Tone. He can meet all the different people who are around. And he realizes that he can collect what would be called today oral history. It was a term which wasn't used at the time. But he can engage with these kind of oral traditions to uncover sources which wouldn't have been documented. The daughters, the brothers, the sons, the wives, the widows. He's interviewing these people, and throughout his life, he's constantly throughout all of his postings with the help of his wife and the help of his children and family, corresponding with all of these people and collecting their traditions. And that's what makes this 11 volume history, and a larger than that even history, so remarkable. So that's the United Irishman, their life, life and lives and times. And for that, he's most well known in Irish history circles. I'll add that there were spin offs from that. So the biography of Robert Emmett is published separately. In in the north, later, there's a, The Lives of Those from Antrim and Down is published as a separate edition. But perhaps the most interesting book is published posthumously, and that's sold. It's found in one of the many auctions. You have this remarkable library of all of his writings, and in his later years, it was sold in auction, right? It was sold piecemeal. And so many of these things have gone lost or they're dispersed in the world. But one piece that was saved, very importantly, was The Literary Remains of the United Irishman. It was a collection in which he collected the poetry that the United Irish people, many of them were poets. Many of the United Irish leaders have written. He collected them together. People like James Hope were poets also. William Dreher, of course. And he collects them. I'll talk about this in a minute because this is worth dwelling on before I move on to our next person. When you read this book, what struck me, this is something I touched on in the book, what struck me was you read the poets, you read the poetry from all these different United Irish men who haven't been acknowledged. Some have, some less. And you read quite a few anonymous poems, because some of these poems were published anonymously, politically they couldn't be published. But sometimes you realize that there's poem, poets published or attributed to a pen name, a pseudonym. And the pseudonym is Erne, I-E-R-N-E, -E, an old name for Ireland. Erne is Madden. So he's writing poetry of the United Irishmen, but it's his poetry about them. And this is quite an interesting moment. It's a moment that he's written so much about and he's spoken with them. He's met with the last living people. He's interviewed them all his life. He becomes obsessed with it. He begins to imagine that he's one of them. So much so, he published in this poetry in the nation, hadn't got a great reception. He puts in this collection. So much so that he writes inside the book, tucked inside, a little kind of passage in the middle of the book where he, he gives a biography of this term about his alter ego. 
Now this is interesting because Madden was obsessed with 1798 because he was born in 1798. Not only was he born in 1798, the story that he tells was that his house was raided by Major Sir. Major Sir is, is in charge of the government counterintelligence. So his house, the man who wrestled the leaders of the United Irishmen. His father's house is raided. It's not quite clear why, because his father was not political, but let's go with the story. The house is raided, and Madden's mother is upstairs in confinement, and she gives birth. So he's born out of fear, like Hobbes. He's born out of fear, and with that, he's obsessed with 17... That's what he explains to himself his obsession with 1798. But Earl is imagined the alter ego. He's already a young man in 1798, and the house is raided by Major Sir. And this young man is disgusted by the way the father is mistreated. So he becomes a rebel. And he goes out and rebels. And then he rebels during the time of Robert Emmett. And after Robert Emmett, he realizes that the best way of dealing with what happened is dedicating your life to preserving its memory. This is quite interesting because Madden was against violence. He's really much in the Conlite school. He opposed the young Irelanders who lauded his work. They all read his work about the United Irishmen. But he opposed their violence. He opposed the Fenians. And so his alter ego takes part with the United Irishmen, which is a noble cause, but realizes that violence is not the answer, and dedicates his life to cleaning their graves. He survives the famine and is kind of forgotten somewhere in the graveyard. He more or less becomes the antiquary, the old mortuary of all, all mortality of Walter Scott. That's the character they imagine. So that's more or less what Madden became in real life. Um, the famous stories of him looking for the remaining United Irishmen, the famous story of um, Anne Devlin, the housekeeper of Robert Emmett. So he finds her destitute in the streets of Dublin. He finds her a job. He finds her a house. When she dies in poverty, he, he erects a grave for her. He erects graves for the various United Irishmen. He supports Thomas Davis in locating the grave in Golden Star of Wolf Tone. He finds all these graves, the Bonds, the Shear Brothers, and he, he finances the graves for them. This is him in his elder age, really, when he's kind of fading away, literally. Uh, with Thomas Addis Emmett, who's looking for Robert Emmett, it's the nephew, looking for the grave of Emmett, which nobody will find, but Madden is showing impossible locations, and they're excavating and looking for them, so that's at the end of his life. And so it's fitting that at the end of his life, he passes away, but that some 20 years later, well, first of all, the funeral, as you say, from Bootas Town, then it's to Donnybrook Cemetery, and all the shops are closed, there's a huge respect for him. And it's fitting that 20 years later, in 1898, pilgrimages are made, at least one major pilgrimage of those who are respecting the United Nations to the grave of Madden, the man who wrote so much about them. And this is Madden's grave itself, to the memory of the man who also built the grave of Anne Devlin, so that's also respected the cemetery. Not easy to find that grave, for a long time its location is forgotten. And the man who identified it is also interesting, it might interest a couple of people in the room here. Rob, you have an interest in it. Leonor Brin. Leonor Brin, a civil servant in Dublin uh, who wrote about Fenians and many other topics, also an amateur historian, and is infatuated with Madden, and writes the only biography to date of Madden, and it's in Irish, and Madenach. And as such, it's not read that often. So it's a great man, and no biography of very biographical pieces of the entries, and that's in itself an indictment when we realize how fertile and so much material is there. Uh, I think that's the image of his ever taken from the National Gallery of Ireland. So, so, so that's the one that's there. So that was briefly a quick tour through the life of Richard Robert Madden. And let's look at somebody else, very different. And we'll see how the two compare next to each other. Maybe don't compare, let's just tell you a different story. Let's put one person aside and hear another remarkable individual Francis Joseph Baker. It troubles me that people often photographed at the elder years of their life, but they'd like to be remembered as they were younger. So I made an effort when I was last in the National Library, I looked through a photograph, I found a photograph album in the National Library in Dublin uh, of, in preparation for this talk. And so here's pictures of him as kind of growing up, so that's as a youth growing up and later. Um, also the youngest child in his family, interesting enough, he was the seventh son. And this he sees a lot of uh, symbolism in the notion that he's the seventh son, but not only the seventh son. His father was also a seventh son, and his grandfather was also a seventh son. So he sees this kind of a man who believed in folklore, so he's the seventh son of a seventh son of a seventh son of a well-to-do merchant family in Belfast. He's very proud of Scottish heritage. He's very proud of this heritage. Um, here he makes on his books, he has this imprint, he has this ex-libris imprint of a merchant family kind of 
creating for himself a kind of coat of arms. Coat of arms are very important for him, as we'll see towards the end here. A coat of arms for a merchant family. And as everything with Madden, you might not be able to read quite the caption that's here, but the caption, it was important for him that this ex labus was printed by Marcus Ward, the Belfast printer, that it was illustrated by John Vinico, the Belfast illustrator, antiquarian drawings. Everything had to be made in Belfast, had to be Ulster made. Very important. He didn't go and commission things elsewhere. And we'll see why that's significant. One quick uh, point which should be made here. Quite often confuse the name Bigger, but of course there's another Bigger, great Bigger in the period, and that is Joseph Gillis Bigger. They're related, they're cousins. I think they're cousins twice removed. They're cousins. The name alternates during these years. E and A can be spelled both ways. Bigger changes his name because he moves from Protestantism to Catholicism. Joseph Gillis Bigger, that's a famous. Um, say the lieutenant of Parnell, famous uh, nationalist parliamentarian in the Home Rule Party. So they're not the same people, though. Uh, they had a good relationship. Bigger quite admired him. Bigger is a quite sometimes described as a Presbyterian. That's a mistake. He's a high church Anglican. Sometimes described as this is important. It's described in remarkable ways that so many admirers described as an Anglican with Franciscan leanings. <laughs> so it's this kind of Catholic guy, which is quite interesting though, you get your head around it, you'll see who the man is and you'll realize how, how, how this goes and quite how you really enjoy that notion. Bigger grows up in this Protestant um, merchant kind of background family in Belfast. He's trained as a solicitor, as a lawyer at Queen's University of Belfast and afterwards in Dublin. Um, this is the law firm that he founds, which is still continuing in a later form today, Bigger and Stratton, and teams up with George W. Stratton. And the place itself, for those who know Belfast, Royal well, Avenue, this is right in the heart of what would have been then, this is again from his photo album, the heart of loyalist, unionist Belfast. But Bigger is interesting because he maintains ties with all sides. More so, he's quite interested. He always finds symbolism in whatever he does. One of their offices is in the office of, in the, in the, the former dwellings of John Ray. For those who know John Ray, a very quixotic figure in 19th century Irish politics, a man who described himself as an orange fiend. So Bigger sees himself quite enjoying this kind of metaphor of an orange fiend, because Bigger has close connections with unionists and with orange men, many of his clients and such. He himself would describe himself more as a nationalist, more as connections with the nationalists, with Catholics. And he works quite clearly between the various circles of Presbyterians, Church of Ireland, various types of Protestants, and Catholics. And he wanders freely between them heads. And it's not an easy thing to do in Belfast of the late 19th century, when uh, sectarian politics are extremely polar polarized. His home is an interesting place. Our dream, this house, don't go looking for it, I look for it, it no longer exists. It's quite sad when you go to the place to see what came out of it. But uh, this house on the slopes of Cave Hill, and he liked the name Ardree. The name was changed in his youth to, to, to Ardree, because Ardree is the high king in Irish. But it's also, as he saw, a tribute to his mother, Mary Jane Ardree. And he was devoted to his mother as the younger son. He grew up with the mother. The mother is brought to the house. The mother dies in the house. There's always respect to the mother. Um, gardening, you could see the garden everywhere. He was well known in his time as a horticulturist, as a gardener, as a beekeeper. All the stories of buying fresh honey whenever you visited him and produce whenever you came. And you'll see who came to visit, you'll realize how people go back and see the correspondence of all this fresh fruit and produce. That's the biggest thing where he most enjoyed himself in our dream. And this is the inside of our dream, uh, the library. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's a young picture of Bridget, his housekeeper is very important. She's dressed in some kind of uniform, and dressing up as a key thing with bigger. What we need to realize about our dream is he used to call this place the Fireside School. That's his rejoinder, his repost, to Yeats's Celtic Twilight. This was the place of a remarkable renaissance, of a revival in its northern sphere. This has been investigated more and more in the last decade. Uh, but it was centered. Anybody who was anybody met in bigger soirees, in his parties, in this kind of coterie of remarkable people. We could just go through the list. It, 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 it's unbelievable when you look at it. Um, the Northerners, the Northern Nationals of the time, Alice Milligan and Edna Carberry and Barbara Hobson and Dennis McCullough and Joseph Connolly and Cattle O'Byrne and Joseph and John Campbell and all these writers, Rutherford and Main, the, the, the playwright, Helen Waddle, Fred and Herbert Hughes, um, Seamus McManus, Cara Healy, politician. Uh, Francis McPeak, I'll come in a minute, Roger Case, but they all frequent his house on a regular basis. People would often be there, less regularly, but often be there. George Birmingham, the novelist, Margaret T. Pender, the Catholic novelist, 
Florence Ray, also a writer, Paul Henry, painter, John Vinicom, all these people are there illustrating. And coming up from Dublin, also on a regular basis, Patrick Pierce, Maud Conn, W.B. Yeats, Patrick Fodricon, Alice Dr. Green, Shane Leslie, William Bolfin, James Connolly, Ernest Blythe, Desmond and Mabel Fitzgerald, Colin O'Loughlin, Celticist Kuno Meyer. I mean, it's a roll call of who's who of Nationalist Ireland at the time, not only Nationalist Ireland. All the culture art we got there. It's, it's a remarkable place to see this kind of Belfast location that they go up to. And that's not the only place where he hosts these meetings. Another place which he was very fond of was a Norman castle that he bought um, in County Down in Cal. Jordan's Castle, which he named Shane's Castle Shane. And this shows where Biggie used to like his imagination right ahead of him. He was an antiquarian and saw himself as very scholarly, but also infused himself always with imagination. He admired, among many Irish historical characters, he admired Shane O'Neill, the great O'Neill. Shane the Proud. And this is seeing himself as kind of admiring Shane the Proud, he named this. He believed this was the castle somehow connected, which probably wasn't connected to Shane O'Neill. But he turned this into be considered today a heritage centre. Putting any kind of old artifact that he can in this place, all these gatherings are meant in these kind of historical settings, which is quite remarkable because you see he bequeathed this um, at the end of his days to the state of Northern Ireland. And they had no idea what to do with this. They just dispersed the whole collection and shoved it away. This is remarkable saying it's not authentic and it's not dated and not seen in different places. That's exactly the point. This is heritage centers in their very beginning. It's a perfect Victorian heritage center, a pioneering one. And just to see that collection itself. So the gatherings would be there, and this was a very, were very colourful events, which were often quite, which were often mocked. You want to see how they're mocked or caricatured? I see these caricatures. So this is bigger, was being Gaelicised here into unbigger, and also niece more bigger. So they're translating you know, bigger, so that's to more. He's doing more, but it's also bigger. And it's also fair. He liked dressing up. He liked dressing up, and what he saw is this Celtic design. He attended pan-Celtic conferences. He liked what he saw. This is the Ulster design. But it wasn't only him dressing up. People who came there dressed up. You can imagine Patrick Pierce had a great time coming up there. They caught exactly what he was doing in St. Andrews. So it's exactly boys dressing up in various costumes, reviving folklore traditions of mumming. Hadn't been mumming going on in Belfast for a good while, but there was mumming outside our tree every Christmas. There were pipers, I'll get to pipers in a minute, and our glass, always dressed up on a Seamus Celtic guard, marches of pipers in different places, walking through. And there's also a serious aspect of this. He also took piping seriously. <laughs> so, Francis Joseph Peake is trained as a traditional piper, the first piper in over a century in Belfast. For those who don't realize the significance of that, then maybe you're about at the right age because the McPeaks were once revered. It's a dynasty, it's the McPeak, the son, the grandson, uh, the McPeak family. These are the people that, the, the McPeak, the, the grandson is the one who meets with John Lennon and Bob Dylan. You know, these are the people who kind of were invited before, before the folk revival. This is the beginning of the folk revival. So this all begins here, this kind of return to music, and which bigger sponsored, to traditional ways into music. Uh, another arena would be the Fesh of the Glens, Feshman Len, in the Glens of Antrim. And this was another place of dressing up and piping and folk craft and traditions which he cultivated and encouraged, of storytelling, of singing. So this is all part of a revival in its northern axis, which brings quite a few Protestants on board as well, which brings also aspect of local traditions which we need to talk to, talk about. So what does this mean? Bigger, who adopted Douglas Hyde's program of de-anglicizing Ireland, but so it's also in a local variant. Here's another caricature. This is bigger home industry, the chorus. He's walking around in self-designed clothes and his pipes and his war pipes. And yet everything is labeled as made in Ulster and made in a certain place. And that's serious in a way which is not just a joke. He took this very seriously. He's one of promoting industry. We often see people who are doing these kind of revivals, the kind of romanticists who harp on the past. So for example, one of his reform plans, he took something which touches Victorian sensibilities somebody who wrote a glowing article about Father Matthew, he decided he wants to look at issues of temperance, not quite temperance, but looked at the state of pubs in Austin and suggested a whole movement of let's having nicer pubs. This is the, 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 the Austin Public House Trust, in which he said there are going to be model inns in Austin which you can stop by. One of them still exists, by the way. The Crown and Sham, and Sham. next time you're in the area, Newtown Abbey, kind of very about to in Carmona, you can see what remains, not quite in its full splendor. It still has pictures on the wall that show you how it used to be. So this is part of reform that he believes has to come to, to Ireland and to Austin in particular. 
This one is for you, Frank. This is cottages. His plans of <coughs> cottages of how Irish laborers deserve better dwellings in a modernist time. So it's a reform agenda designing a two room, a three room, a four room, and a crush to give proper cottages to their laborers. So that's his engagement with better dwelling. Um, and as an antiquarian, he was a member of a whole host of societies. That's what antiquarians did. Madden, of course, is a member of the Royal Irish Academy. It always begins there. But you look at Madden, of course, he's, the, the, he's a member of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. Rises up to the top, becomes vice president. He's a member of the Belfast Naturalist Field Club, which was an extremely active club at the time, engaging with issues of natural history, which we called it at the time, uh, trips through nature, um, zoology, botany, and he was considered a major authority, but also history and archaeology. He always put archaeology on the map. The Belfast uh, Natural History and Philosophical Society, the Belfast Library, and Society for Promoting Knowledge. That's the Lennon Hall. And the Lennon Hall existed way before that, but he's largely one of the key people responsible for their collection of Irish studies, Irish and Ulster studies. So the fact that scholars today all over the world go to look at Irish studies in the Lennon Hall, it starts with books that Bigger bought as a student when he was in Dublin studying law, and a whole collection which he brought and promoted there. Irish language was important for him. He took Padre Cochet's classes in Belfast. It's developed into the Belfast Gaelic League, and he's appointed to the executive board of the National Gaelic League, the Ulster Literary Theatre. More or less simultaneous to what's happening in Dublin. More or less. An interesting moment, which rises for a moment with interesting collaborations. He's the patron of it. He publishes their paper, Allah, which is a remarkable paper at its time. The Folk Song Society in London, he's a founding member of that, the short-lived Common Achanachas, the Folklore Society. So he's behind all these moves of these revivalist moments. If we want to talk, and I'll run through it briefly because I realize my time is running out, I go on this map, on and on and on. So a few quick snippets because I try to keep things within a framework. And some time is running. He wrote some books. He's not well known for his books. Perhaps, I mean, he wrote about traditions of Down. He was well known for this lecture, Hills of Holy Ireland. It's a small pamphlet which he traveled and lectured, invited all around Ireland to talk about traditions of Ireland. Interesting. Engagement in geography and traditions, um, which would be interesting for yourself, no, but to geography. Um, the Ulster Land War of 1770 would be his most famous book, and it's not a great book historically, I can say that myself. Unlike Madden, he was a great writer of big books, and that's not where he invested his energy. He did invest his energy in writing essays. And one of the first things I did when I came here to the remarkable Burns Library is I asked Andrew, uh, who's a great resource, he helps people all the time, I asked him if they could scan for me, give me a copy of the Hayes catalogue of periodicals. It's a standard resource to go and see which periodicals are written. And I go through this, and I find 11 pages pieces that bigger, of articles that bigger publishing periodicals. Now I can tell you there's more than that because I found pieces which are outside, but I counted, I counted again today to make sure I'm right, 387 articles. So he publishes essays everywhere on a whole range of topics which relate to history and archaeology and horticulture and gardening, but mainly historical subjects. His main venue was the Ulster Journal of Archaeology. This was the leading journal of antiquarianism in Ulster. Originally founded in the mid 19th century by great mid 19th century antiquarians like uh, McAdam, should point McAdam, rather. but he revives it in the late 19th century, he pulls together all the remarkable scholars, some of them still the veteran scholars of the previous edition, or the previous series, and for a period of 17 years, he runs this journal where all the greats contribute to it, and Bigger not only edits it, Bigger said first co editing it with a local historian called. Uh, Robert McGill Young, famous antiquarian in his time as well, but he continues throughout the whole series. He also writes for each edition as well. So a whole series of articles coming out of that. If you want to realize his impact and why these articles are so important, we don't have citation indexes, do we, for the, for the time. I mean, nowadays, academia works differently. The way to do citation indexes in Victorian studies would be simply to look at the clients. And that's remarkable. A whole study can be done. He also for Madden, by the way. A study can be looked at how George Birmingham, he writes The Northern Iron, this novel, which is probably the best novel written about 1790. A lot has been written about them. Uh, one of my favorites, at least. Of course, it's dedicated to Bigger. Uh, as I wrote out a classic 
work of folklore, of urban folklore, and Belfast comes out in two series, of course, dedicated by Carlo Byrne to Madden, the story of the harp, interesting. So it's all these, it's just a selection of a few things. Songs of Allah, a key text in putting northern music on the map of Irish music is dedicated to Madden. Another way of looking, looking through his correspondence, his main archive of the Belfast Central Library has 3,000 letters. There's many other letters scattered in collections all around him, archives all over. And he corresponded with everybody. And all the time, people are writing him and acknowledging him that he's giving them the material they need for their work. You can't understand how to stop for greed without meeting first. Um, bigger. The whole series of other people. So he's a key, he's a spider in a web in many ways. And that's remarkable. So how do I connect between these two people? Very briefly. An interesting point is Bigger's inspiration from that. Bigger saw himself. He didn't go and travel around the world. He stayed locally the whole time. But he always saw himself inspired by man. If Madden wrote the shrines and sepulchres of the old world anew, Bigger, the famous radical newspaper, the Sean van Vogt, which was published in the north, in Northern Ireland around the turn of the, in Belfast, around the turn of the century, with two very radical women, at the Cadre of Alice Milligan, he wrote the neglected shrines and sepulchres of Ireland's illustrious dead. So he's looking at an Irish version of it as a series. And it's interesting enough, how do we know he wrote it? Because he always wrote under pseudonyms. It takes a while to kind of check his pseudonyms. It's written by Anne Ray. Does that look similar? Remember Ern? Sorry. Remember Ern? He's reversing Ern. Right? So he's paying tribute by Bill Belfort by coding his name as, Bill, as, as Madden in reverse, which is remarkable. If Madden wrote, the United Nations, their lives and times, Bigger spent most of his life, his great passion, was writing the lives of the northern United Nations. His interest was always in those in Ulster. And he traveled around Ulster collecting stories from anybody he, he could meet. And he collected folklore from anywhere he could find. He was a great pioneer of folklore studies, in many ways, collected oral traditions, collecting any piece of material he could, and spent his life writing volume upon volume of the lives of the northern United Nations and didn't get to publish them. For those who want to understand why you can read my book, there's a whole context to that. But only one is published. The rest are still in manuscript form. And that's interesting, preserved in good state. If Madden went around preserving graves and saving them, that's exactly what Bigger did as well. So here he is tracing with the folk song collector Herbert Hughes, collecting, tracing graves to the antiquarian pursuit. But that's what he does for the United Irishmen as well. He goes around and restores their graves and sets up graves for them. Time and time again, if people like Roddy McCauley from the famous song, or um, William Steele Dixon, the radical minister, or Marianne McCracken, the sister of Henry Joy McCracken, or James Hope, the working man's hero, place after place, he goes to places. In some of these cases, Madden had met these people before. Madden had funded their original gravestone, which had fallen to decay. Bigger goes after him and restores these sons. And he believes in this project that he's doing, where he sees himself as a nationalist, but first of all, as an Ulster man. So Ulster has a place within a wider Ireland. Ulster with its Protestants and its Catholics. He'll travel all around Ireland giving his talks. And he'll believe in this all the way. 1916 will be a big shock for him. Many of the people who visited him are implicated in 1916. Some died like Roger This is terrible. It's a terrible blow. A man who was not violent, was very gentle, who couldn't deal with violence really. He could deal with violence in the past in a romantic way. And he'll believe in this all the way through to partition. A remarkable article. In 1922, he publishes an Irish Independent for Belfast. In 1922, he publishes the flags and arms of Ireland. And he says Ireland has so many symbols. All of them should be respected. Each one has its provincial. Ulster has its own, but also Munster has its own. You have to bring them all together and find a flag for Ireland. And the key point is that it should, oh, it should be undivided. That's his point here. Undivided, as the Ulster motto, motto puts it. So he's putting Antioch here. So he still believes in an undivided Ireland exactly as the partition has happened. Partition breaks. After partition, he never goes down south again. His world more or less falls apart around him. He's still active for a while. He's honored by the academy in 1926. A few months later, he passes away. He's given an honorary MA, uh, praised heavily by the professor of history in, uh, in Queens, University of Belfast. And it's a rare moment because this is the moment where professional historians can still praise the amateur, can say, We've learned a lot from you from your resources. Ten years later, we won't hear about that anymore. I just stop from turning its back to amateur historians. <coughs> this will be myth and folklore and 
and not the way professional history should be done. Archaeology will move away from antiquarians, all these disciplines will separate. Sociology will emerge, other disciplines will emerge to all be together. So, if I showed you Madden's growth, bigger, of course, wants to be buried in Malask. He sees himself next to United Irishman as his family roots, not far from Jenny Hope. But Bigger is no longer remembered for a long time in the new Northern Ireland. In 1971, as the UVF, probably the UVF, as paramilitaries of some sort, Royal paramilitaries of some sort, are blowing up various monuments in retort to what they see as uh, IRA attacks uh, on memory as well, to memory being shoved in their face. Um, Bodenstown was bombed around that time and other places. An interesting thing happens which seems curious to many places. The grave is bombed in Molusk Cemetery, the grave of Bigger. That's the grave over there. Um, destroyed, seen as a case of vandalism. Perhaps because of the writing in Gaelic, in Irish, which is here. Perhaps because he's seen as a problematic person during the Troubles, as a man who brought together Catholics and Protestants, a Protestant who could celebrate nationalism and still see himself as an Ulster man who demanded to be buried with the flag of Ulster on his heart. So how do you deal with somebody like that in, in what's happening? What's remarkable is this grave, the grave in front, is the grave of Jenny Hope, which he erected. So the grave of the United Irishman is there, and the grave of Bigger is the one that's destroyed. Both people, as James noted, at least for Madden, have blue plaques for them now. That's the older plaque in Bhutistan for Madden. That's the plaque outside the pub that I showed you for Bigger. But really, they've never been given the attention they deserve. No biography of Bigger, it's amazing. Different biographical essays came out in the last 10, 15 years, till then nothing serious. Um, Roger Dixon at the Ulster Museum has done a lot of very, very good work. A few other people have commented very interesting things, but no full-scale biography. So both Madden and Bigger are kind of on the side. And yet, I would argue, maybe you can do some questions and answers. I've spoken too much, but I'll end with two last questions, two last points. One is that these amateur historians, these antiquarians, which are often brushed aside, I think there's an interesting lesson to be learned for Irish studies and for Irish history, looking back at what they wrote and how they lived their lives. In both cases, both their biographies and at their works, their lives and works. So much for Irish studies, which is supposed to be about breaking the disciplines and moving and asking the big questions and traveling around them. Uh, that's what we're supposed to be doing, but now we see that as interdisciplinary. This is before the disciplines were formed. That is exactly the work that antiquarians did. So there's a whole model to be re-explored. And the second point, which I should have been discussing the whole evening, but we'll have to leave it in our mind, perhaps, uh, because I took too much time describing the lives. But the second point, of course, is what we see here are two very different approaches. Madden was a nationalist. He wrote this key nationalist text. It's a key text in the, in the library of Irish nationalists in the lives of the United Irishmen. And yet he's not a typical nationalist. I'd say he's a transnational nationalist. He travels around the world, he meets different people, he brings these ideas back down, he's always engaged in the wider questions. All the time this comes together. He doesn't see a contradiction between that form of nationalism and this kind of internationalism and cosmopolitanism. But when Achieves independence, that's not the ethos of the state. It might be where Ireland is arriving now, belatedly, or took its time to get there. But Ireland for a long time closed itself. Nationalism is often seen even today as inward looking, as closed. So this kind of option goes down. Everybody praised Madden. You can, you can see Madden being praised again and again by Fianna Fáil, coming and nail politicians all the time. But they mean his nationalism in the most narrow sense. Bigger, on the other hand, is also a strange. Sorry, a strange person. Bigger is a nationalist regionalist. He's a nationalist fully, and yet Ulster is at the heart of things. The first allegiance is to the region, the region falls within a larger pattern, and that's how respecting a region and understanding its uniqueness is how to find a place within a larger patchwork. That was also a model for Ireland, which Bigger believed in. But of course, with partition and with the development of Northern Ireland, that's not what happened. It wasn't on the table. Maybe now will be on the table again, maybe not. But these kind of options which are there are quite remarkable. And we find them in the most unexpected of places by following the lives of amateur historians. So I just thought to share the kind of approach that I'm looking at yourself tonight. Thank you very much.
human beings were not, not a, a person supportive of uh, physical force tradition. And he wrote about the you know, Irishman that uh, came to mind, the famous article by Oliver done uh, 50 years ago, in which he sees the commemoration of past revolution as a sort of unitive thing in the present that brings both sides together. It seems to be that function. Anyway, let's have a few questions. If anyone has just a couple of questions. Sorry for taxing you so long. Yeah, we have to say we're contemporary historians. Um, but I know we still spend time in Bali for the first impressive public intellectual story of Europe. And we spend a great deal of time um, sort of engaging in local history and uh, encouraging uh, feedback. What do you see, how do you see sort of amateurs today being um, regarded by professions? Well, well, wait, just see if I can see need to go to the microphone, sorry. Um, so the question is what about the relation of amateurs and professionals today? The situation is very different today. You gave a clear example of a very unconventional story, who in many ways is part of that tradition. I think a lot has been said about the revisionist debate in Ireland and what I think that's been done almost to death. But I think an interesting point to mention here is that the professionalization of Irish history came with a certain price. It's remarkably important, but it did turn itself back to various traditions of local scholarship. And with it threw away a lot of great um, material, which is also Irish, essentially Irish in the way it was done. Um, so much so I'm willing to push that forward, I'm willing to, to present a thesis, but that's a little we'll point to another day. I think that is why perhaps Irish history punched below its weight, often. I think had it engaged with this past the way that literature did, for example, and poetry did, and theatre does, and even Irish film does, engage with traditions, a different kind of Irish historiography would have developed. Now, local history has always been a huge thing in it. And for years, this also seen as local. It's, a flourish, it's always been a flourish of local history societies. And at times, they emerge on the centre stage, and most of the time, not. But you can follow. The journals of local history are huge. May News picked on that more than any other university, having local history studies and publishing this is work that academics could do an MA in local history and you publish it, so that's a good connection. But for many academic historians, the local historians do the, the footwork and they look at the Eagles view, and it's the few people who actually take the effort to, to, to realize the amount of expertise which is local. And it's this dialogue that happens there. The dialogue which is often seen as the dialogue of you use a different language almost. It's almost kind of a, kind of a, a biglossia needs to be done here, the language of academic history and local history. But the two are very close because in the end, History in Ireland is also a popular pursuit. And you can see this very clearly coming together in issues like commemoration, like 1916 for the moment, or the Irish Revolution. There's all the local studies are meeting with the national studies. And I'd like to see that happen in many other areas as well. It's remarkable to see the people in the past who took that step and did it. And that's quite remarkable. And yes, I accept the fact that some people don't want to see Belgium their locality, and they have a lot of work to see there. And also, I'm always weary of the quick affinities, right? So a lot of people in Irish study kind of 
of them, which can come off into can often be these shadow statements of the Catholic Irish are predisposed to see always the weak and help the weak. And we know that's not always the case. Man himself demonstrates it. Yes, he saw himself as an Irish Catholic, always seeking out the weak and helping out the slaves with the Aboriginals. And yet he encountered other Irishmen who were not with that approach at all. We have to see all these complexities happening at the same time. So it's not that there's an immediate affinity. These parallels work on different levels. And nationalism can be both inward looking, localism can also be very close shop, and it can also be seeing ties with other people. And those are the interesting moments to tease out these frictions. He worked a bit about Irish. He made an effort to study Irish. Right? This is part of a conscious effort there, which is important. He made an effort to use Irish in his writings, and he made an effort to, to, to engage with it. And yet, and when he was dealing with medieval texts, it was also important for him to restore bits and pieces. And yet, his main passion when it comes to the United Irishmen was dealing with people whose dialect was also just Scots. And that's important. That's why Frank's presence in the room is this, particularly when Frank Ferguson is the expert in Ulster Scots. Uh, he's by chance with us today working at the Bonner Rose Library, so it's, it's a great moment. But in these moments, and I, I follow the same path. When I wrote my own book, I'm always followed in bigger, both in Madden and Bigger's footsteps. That's how I, in, in relation to the United Irishman. So I could see the problem. Madden didn't engage with Irish language material at all. Bigger tried to, but the material led him on a different path. There was very little written in Irish about it. When it came to earlier periods, he worked with it, and yet, he didn't really, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a great scholar of the manuscript tradition, so you won't find too much material there. The earlier he dealt, he dealt more and more with material culture. So it would be, be called pioneering archaeology, or by some people, sham archaeology. It was heavily criticized afterwards for the damage that was done to these sites by unprofessionalized techniques. When an academic, uh, immediately after he died, an academic archaeologist came up and said, this whole work is worthless. The response in the countryside is remarkable. For weeks, the newspaper that published that got a strong response from people. So, what do you mean worthless? And we learned so much from this person. That in itself says something. So, it's the ability to appreciate that is interesting in its own right. One last question. Uh, you implied that Bigger was, was very surprised and perhaps disappointed or almost shattered by the events of 1916. Mm -hmm. Yet, he clearly had met some of the leaders. Yes. Where did that come from? Where did that Was he blindsided? Was he not? Um, it's, it's very good. So there's a few things about that. Some of the correspondents suggest that some of them knew that it was too gentle for these issues. But they were purpose, you know, they, had, they used to have this, this correspondence. I, uh, I saw this in, 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 uh, in, in one of the kind of correspondences where they, they talk about the fact that they'd wait for Bigger to go to his solicitor's office and then they'd start conspiring. So Bigger, in theory, was all for an independent Ireland. But when he did see violence on the streets, and the scripture said he fainted and he couldn't deal with it. And he wasn't, he wasn't the right temperament for that. On the other hand, he also was dealing with very dangerous things, right? He encouraged people with dealing clearly by reenacting the past. And they constantly reenacted the, the to Castle Shane with every enactment with pikes, you know, they walk around. All this rhetoric can cut both ways. His involvement in more or less staging and choreographing the 1898 centenary of the United Irishman in Belfast. And he's inspiring all these issues. He was dealing with dangerous issues. This had a violent reaction from the unionists. And he saw the problems of these issues. So he was doubling with problems. Uh, what happens there? He refused to cooperate with these people in 1916. He closed the door to some of them when they were looking for hiding, meaning saying, you better move on, don't stay with me. But he was particularly also worried about himself how he would be implicated. The Roger Casement case shattered him very, very deeply. Roger Casement corresponded with him all the time. So what does that mean as the trial proceeds? Uh, they were very close. Um, th these issues troubled him. So what are the implications for that? Um, and that is a moment of stepping back. And partitions were breaks and complete.